So, um, so uh, Roger, if you don't mind, we've done the introductions. If you could kind of, you and Linda introduce yourselves and take it over from here, that would be great. Hi, everyone. I'm Linda. Um, I'm here in Longmont, Colorado, where Roger and I've lived for more years than I want to admit to. And um, I'm kind of like Gloria. I do all kinds of things. I planted Pawnee Eagle Corn in 1992. Most of my cooking is um, chocolate chip cookies, and I'm getting pretty good at those. She's great um, at those. <laughs> <laughs> and I work at the National Center for Atmospheric Research and just found out recently I should be able to work from home from now on so I can keep an eye on Roger while he is in his office doing tons and tons of Pawnee research and I'll turn it over to Roger. Well, welcome to everybody to this uh, meeting. I'm really excited about this to have uh, Ed Jolie and uh, his student Jennifer uh, join us, as well as all the other guests who uh, some of you are here for the first time. Uh, so let me just uh, do a general kind of uh, introduction here. As Lance and Deb said, uh, um, one of their siblings, Walter, is our other sibling. He's the president of the Bonnie Nation Business Council. And our uh, grandfather was George Echoak, who was married to Mamie Echoak, Gloria. I just thought I'd mention that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where Mamie comes into the family. Mamie oh, was George George's um, the third wife. And so uh, that's how we fit in. Now, George is... Uh, his father was Echoak, as uh, I think Lance mentioned. Echoak, uh, he, was, he was born in about 1854 in the late summer, according to his own account. And uh, his grandmother was, her name was um, Cheita, and that means Matt Reed. That is uh, a reference to some of the technology I think we're going to hear about tonight. So uh, our family connection to what we're going to hear um, goes back to that ancestor who took this name, I think, because of her facility, her skill with weaving and doing, uh, you know, construction of uh, furniture and baskets and things like that. Amazing. Now, I wanted to start up by mentioning that in 1989, I went to an archaeology conference, first uh, archaeology conference I went to, the World Archaeological Congress. And uh, there were a number of invited guests to this uh, special meeting. And of the people who identified there as Indians, two of them identified as Indians who do archaeology, pioneers in Indian country doing archaeology. And they uh, were not the only Indians doing archaeology at that time, but uh, Pretty much that was maybe half of the people who were doing archaeology in Indian country at that point in time. And so uh, during the 90s, the 1990s, a small group of, uh, of uh, people who identified racially as Indians uh, were getting into archaeology and going to conferences. And uh, in 2001, uh, one of the leading figures in that new group of people uh, gathered together everybody he could identify who was involved in 
Indian country and archaeology at the time. There was just a few of us there, but still, that was kind of the start of what is now called indigenous archaeology. Ed uh, joined us, I think, uh, a year or two after that, uh, just a few years after that, and uh, participated in the founding of what now I think is pretty well established as uh, um, a really uh, lively group of uh, academic scholars who do archaeology and identify in some way as racial Indians. And so uh, this is really uh, a special night to have two uh, people who are a part of that world, who have the academic credentials uh, to show their commitment to developing this. And so I'm really excited, you know, about this meeting tonight. This is uh, a new thing in the world. And so, uh, as far as I can understand Ed's story, he got interested in the topic that he's going to talk about tonight when he was an undergraduate in college. And he started doing research on uh, gambling baskets and uh, weaving technologies, started publishing stuff uh, very soon after that. I don't know how long it was after that, but uh, Ed has done a lot of research, uh, not just on uh, planes, materials, um, and, and Ed, I'll let you introduce yourself, but Ed, um, is, uh, he's got uh, Oglala Sioux ancestry, as well as Adolji Muskogee ancestry, and that's where his citizenship is. Um, so I thought I'd mention that. You can clarify that further if you wish. Uh, but I think tonight um, we are going to continue a theme that we started off with our family meetings, and that is the role of women in, Pawnee, in the Pawnee world. And we started off our meetings talking about the status of women in the Pawnee world and the seed preservation project has come up very often in our meetings. And I see this as a natural extension of that. And um, as my sister Deb and others have tried to promote the, uh, the reinvigoration of, uh, of various uh, projects like building earth lodges and uh, other things. Um, maybe this is a, a circumstance that will get on to the agenda in some fashion at some point, and that is looking at weaving techniques and um, that technology. And so I'm really excited to have Ed here tonight to give us an overview. And Ed, Ed also, I want to mention that Ed is he studies this technology, not just in the plains, but across North America, the Americas, and the world at large. So we have a real authority with us tonight. I'm looking forward to hearing, hearing more. Thanks for joining us, Ed and Jennifer, and for the work that you've done with local communities nationwide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I guess I, I think uh, with that, I'll, I'll take over a little bit and start talking. And, and first, I, I really want to extend my gratitude to um, to Roger for helping pull this together. And, and of course, Lance. And uh, it's it's really great to see Roger and, and Linda. It's been a number of years uh, since we got together in person. Um, again, it's, it's one of those things as we get older, it's more years than I care to think about. <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm grateful for uh, if there's a silver lining to a lot of this pandemic activity, it's been the, the ability to do things like this and um, it, things that would have been a lot more challenging to do. And so I think, um, uh, you know, what I want to do is maybe talk a little bit more, elaborate on some of the things that, that Roger raised and talk about sort of my background. And I think one of the, the things that can be challenging is that 
not knowing people's level of interest or background or expertise or what people are going to find the most useful, uh, I, I'm always thinking about trying to make things as useful to the people that I'm, I'm talking to or talking at and talking with as possible. And so I tried to pull together some images that would sort of uh, allow me to sort of uh, use them as a springboard, a point of departure to talk about some things that are of interest to me. And generally, I find that if I, if I start talking about the things that are of interest to me and that I get excited about and that are, are I think are fascinating or, or cool insights from archaeology and what anthropology can do for um, traditional communities, I think it opens up a door to have more conversations about where and how anthropology can be made useful, where we can put it to work. Uh, and that's a big interest because, um, you know, as, as some of you may well know, anthropologists and archaeologists in particular don't have the best reputation um, oh, in, in Indian country. And, and that's with good reason that they did a lot of really nasty things. Uh, and it was one of those things that I didn't find out until years later that my, my mother was very unhappy that I went into, um, was going into archaeology, but she, uh, you know, to her credit, bit her tongue and, and waited and watched and, and sort of had a, a change of heart. So, um, I'm, I'm attentive to, to those concerns and that history. It's one of those things we kind of have to acknowledge and work through. But I think the turning point for me was, like Roger was saying, um, when I first sort of became exposed to some of these questions, I saw an opportunity and avenue to um, reclaim lost knowledge or dormant knowledge, to, to learn things that uh, might have been lost, uh, reclaim some of these things. And that's very much the, the position that I operate from nowadays, is, is what can I do to make this useful uh, and relevant? Um, you know, knowledge for knowledge sake is, is great, but it's, it's more fulfilling when it, when it serves a purpose that, that satisfies people other than, than yourself. And I think a, a lot of us feel that way. So um, I, I have some slides. I, I have, it looks like 13 here, but I did, um, God bless Jennifer for, for, for joining us, not only because she's been driving cross country for a, a, a fellowship at the Smithsonian Institution in DC, um, but she has to put up with me a great deal anyway. And uh, I threw a couple of her, her slides um, in at the end so she can talk more about the amazing work that she's um, been involved with and, and been up to. And, and these are all things that I should point out beforehand that she was involved with and did um, before I ever met her, before she came to U of A. This is all sort of from her and, and her collaborative relationships with other community members in the, in the Choctaw Nation. So I will get there, but it, it seems pertinent. I'm going to try and share my screen here. Um, I think... Uh, you know, if there are questions that come up, uh, you know, don't don't hesitate to, to ask. But I, what I suspect is that um, at, at the end, sort of when I'm given my, my spiel and talked about sort of my interests and, and, and angle of approach to these things and some things that I've been doing is I think probably there'll be a lot of questions and discussion that will follow from that. And my hope is that rather than giving a, a really formal overarching presentation, um, I can respond to questions in ways that allow me um, to off the cuff as best I can answer questions, but also I can jot down notes and, um, and be thinking about resources. And that's really what I would like to do is, is make myself available as a resource, um, you know, uh, to acquire things or, or help you get the answers um, that you want. Um, because, you know, again, it's one of these things that, that we, we can only absorb and, and hold onto so much in our heads. Um, the, the real important thing is, is being able to, to know where to go to, to find what we want and what we need when we need it. So my hope is to, is to be able to serve uh, as a bit of that resource. Okay, let's see here. Share screen. Okay. Can everybody see that okay? Everybody sees uh, a, a basket with some dice? Okay, perfect. Uh, and Gloria, Gloria, I'm so glad uh, that you're here. Um, I, I did, I spent a lot of time, it's been some years studying um, basketry traditions on the plains. And um, to hear that you're producing some of those, those burden baskets uh, is really, uh, it really warms my heart because I, I wasn't aware that anybody um, was still making those. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to, to hear about that. Um, and I'm probably going to want to chat more with you in detail at some point, um, but it's fabulous stuff. Well, this this is very much the basket that started all. This is uh, my Unchi's uh, basket. It's a, a cool gambling basket. It's a technology that's very ancient. This this sort of basic technology for coil basketry goes back, based on archaeological evidence, uh, almost 10,000 years, at least sort of 9,000 years, that sort of basic technology for this style of, of making a basket. Um, and basketry, uh, outside of those, the burden baskets and these coiled gambling baskets, 
um, are, are really the, the sort of the primary types of, of perishable technology that, that we're aware of uh, from an anthropological sense when it comes to, to plains anthropology and archaeology. Um, obviously, there was matting and cordage and, and rope and things like that. Um, but, you know, those are, are in many ways ubiquitous. And, and it's uh, sometimes a, a downside for those ubiquitous technologies that they, they don't get as much attention or, or description uh, or recordation. Um, the same thing is true for the, the baskets on the plains, in, in large part because, uh, you know, so much of plains mature culture is celebrated for um, the hide working, uh, quill work and bead work, and, and rightly so, it's it's pretty spectacular stuff. Um, but as my mother said that, you know, we, we have these baskets and, and, and the, they, they don't quite compare to, to some of the other baskets from famous, uh, you know, basket weavers in California, they're, they're our own uh, and they're telling a story. Um, that we need to continue to listen to. And so, um, like Roger said, I, I first got into this stuff in, in college, uh, and my major professor as an undergraduate in Northwestern Pennsylvania, where I went to school, was Jim Adavasio, who uh, excavated a, a site called Metacroft Rock Shelter, which is one of the early sites in the 70s to, to really uh, push the envelope and say that, that, that our ancestors had been here, uh, you know, more than 12, 13,000 years ago, that it might be 18, 19, or even more, uh, a greater length of time. And as it turned out, in addition to working at that sort of famous site, he was a specialist, is a specialist in perishable technologies in our calendar, so baskets, textiles, uh, string, nets, footwear, and the like. And I had the opportunity to take a, a class in perishable technology with him as a, as a college student. Uh, and up to that point, I'd, I'd had an interest in archaeology, but had been doing a lot of colonial period historic archaeology in Maryland, where I grew up. And uh, I, I recall that we had a, the, this family piece, uh, Unchu's gambling basket. And so I brought it in and he was aware of sort of the one article that had been written in the thirties uh, by Gene Weltfish, uh, a rather famous uh, ethnographer and anthropologist who worked um, with a number of, of Pawnee communities. Uh, and it was about really about the production of Pawnee gambling baskets because that was sort of the sole uh, surviving uh, tradition of manufacture of these. And uh, that was a turning point for me in as much as I spent a lot of time as, as I could my last couple of years in college, looking at museum specimens, um, conducting you know, research in the literature to try and find out everything I could and learn more about them because they're just, there hasn't been a lot written. I remember talking to one, um, uh, one, one priest in South Dakota and he told me that perhaps I, I couldn't find anything because they, it was because they didn't exist. Uh, and I'm like, well, I, I think there is some evidence that, that these things do exist. Um, and he, he demurred and thought perhaps that was the case, but certainly they wouldn't have been for gambling. I said, well, Father, I, th <laughs> I think you might be coming at this from a, a particular perspective, um, but respectfully, uh, we've got good evidence they were gambling. And in fact, um, the fact that, that Unchi, um, we've lost her name to time, but Unchi is Lakota for grandmother, that, that she had her own basket, uh, the evidence suggests that means she was probably, probably really into it. Uh, most of the women that that had their own baskets were or made their own baskets were really into it. As it turns out, um, in terms of the number of, of gambling baskets that survived, the vast majority come from uh, in and around Pine Ridge, where my my, my Lakota family is from, um, but also throughout uh, Pawnee territory as well as uh, Cheyenne territory. Uh, and it was a women's game. So it very much speaks to some of the broader issues you're all interested in. Uh, at least historically, it was a game played primarily by women, um, at least through some surviving oral tradition in my family. This was the, the game that women played uh, while the men were out ostensibly uh, killing bison. Uh, and sometimes wagers would be made on sort of the, the expectation of, of what hides would be brought home and, and perhaps some wagers about who would be doing what labor. Um, the dice are, are a mixture of peach and plum pits that have sort of been polished and, and rubbed smooth, as well as dice made from bison rib bone. Uh, there are a lot of variations in how the game was played. And in fact, this sort of broader uh, basket or, or bowl dice game is, it's extremely widespread throughout North America. Uh, there are versions that I encountered to my surprise in Seneca territory uh, in, in Southwestern New York, um, all the way you know, across into California, there are variations of this game. Uh, and in general, for the Plains version, the, the dice are cast into the basket, the basket is shaken and slammed down on the ground really hard. And the dice pop up out of the center and they fall down and the women playing the game would, would make wagers uh, based on their predicted outcomes. Uh, at least sort of that's the, the general frame for how the game has been played. Um, 
But that obviously led to a, a lot wider interest because I, as I began to ask questions about sort of where the technology, where that quill bastard came from, I got really interested and said, well, how does this relate to these other technologies? I started looking for context. Um, and one of the things that always appealed to me about archaeology is that it wasn't just um, learning about the past and interesting history, but it was, it was family history. I felt like the archaeology of America, is, this, is, this is our history. And so that was a, a sort of a deep, uh, fascinating point of, of interest for me is that, you know, the historical documents could only tell us so much. We've got gaps in, in oral tradition. Um, where can we fill things in and elaborate on that? And so um, what you see here really is just sort of a selection, a smattering of some of the, the really early perishable technologies. And I, I threw this slide up not to so much contrast with the, the gambling basket, but to give you sort of a, a brief illustration of not only some of the diversity of, of baskets and textiles and, and footwear that were being made um, more than 10,000 years ago in the Americas, but to, to illustrate to you how sophisticated some of this stuff is. Uh, some of these exceptionally fine twine bags are sort of, if you want to think about them in some way, they're kind of similar to the um, parfleche, uh, sort of these, these large flat wallets or, or bags. Um, these are from, uh, were found with the Spirit Cave ancestor in, in Nevada, and these go back um, well over 10,300 years. Uh, and these look like photographs, but they're actually um, illustrations, really exceptional illustrations. Um, footwear, well attested, uh, not, not so much moccasins, although there were moccasins that go back uh, over 10,000 years with the Spirit Cave ancestor. Um, but a well-established tradition of footwear throughout much of the Western US, um, woven uh, as these examples are out of oftentimes uh, tule or bulrush, as well as sagebrush bark. We go further south, um, we find that we're not purely limited by the record in, in North America uh, for the, the earliest uh, Native American settlers in, in the Americas, but uh, there's a smattering of sites in South America, for example, Monte Verde uh, and, and Costa Chile is, is one of those sites. And here you see um, a site that was preserved by having been in an area that became waterlogged and, and over the last you know, 14,000 years became a peat bog. Uh, that sort of environment was conducive to good organic preservation after it buried the archeological deposits. Um, and so we've got bits of animal hide. They even found chunks of, of what looked like mammoth meat um, and bits of twisted juncus around wooden, carved wooden stakes uh, that go back over 14,400 years ago. Uh, and so these and, and really more recent years have been some of those, those pieces of evidence um, that have shown Native Americans have been here a lot longer than people had long assumed. Uh, and the thing that I love to point out and remind people of is that they're the perishable things, the things that are really giving us the clearest, strongest indicators that, that our ancestors were here that long ago, and, and even longer by extension, um, are these things that rarely survive. Um, this doesn't look like much on the lower left, but this is another sort of 14,000, 200 year old piece of what's probably matting. Uh, and in fact, I, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that sort of the basic technology called twining that you see represented here, uh, which is sort of ubiquitous, really common in, in matting, uh, particularly with, with bulrushes or cattails, um, is probably not too far off as, as analogy for what type of matting has probably been used uh, in, in more recent times across the plains. Um, and here we have evidence, suggestive evidence of that's over 14,000 years old. Now we have that in, in from the Paisley Caves in South Central Oregon. But if we go uh, not quite as far south as Mesa Verde, or Mesa, uh, Monte Verde, not Mesa Verde, Monte Verde in Chile, um, we uh, head to the uh, highlands, uh, the Peruvian Andes, to a site called Guitarero Cave. Uh, and that's where the fragments on the right here are from. Uh, these were uh, preserved by happenstance at more than 2,500 meters above um, sea level. And so we, we get good preservation throughout part of the, the Andes, uh, particularly the Peruvian coast where it's in the rain shadow of the Andes mountains. And it's really, really dry and arid. And so you get good preservation. As you go up uh, higher elevations, it can be dry, but not quite as dry. And so sort of the unique circumstances of a, a dry cave or rock shelter combined with, um, you know, use by humans uh, resulted in there being uh, bits of cordage and string and, and fibers, as you see here, uh, including a piece of matting made out of sort of the local equivalent of a bulrush, um, uh, what they call um, tortora uh, throughout much of South America. Uh, this fragment here that you see with the residue, the dark residue goes back, we directly dated it to over um, about uh, almost 11,000 years old. 
and some of the cordage is even a couple hundred years older than that. Um, so again, you know, one of the things that's long appealed to me is not only um, have these been sort of neglected or biased in part because of the bias of preservation, they don't survive in a lot of archeological settings, but there's also by and large been a, a gender bias operating here. And that is that cross-culturally, when you look at uh, many different societies all over the world, who, what, what gender typically produces these crafts, it's almost always women. These tend to be female dominated crafts. And that's not to say that, that men don't produce them sometimes or even in, in certain societies a lot of the time or all the time, but rather that big picture thinking, it, these are typically female dominated crafts. Um, and that means that not only by sort of neglecting them or, or missing them in the archeological record, we're, we're missing that, that contribution and, and uh, those productive uh, you know, labors of, of women in the past, but you're also talking about crafts that were performed by women even more recent times and so weren't necessarily as accessible or certainly as interesting to early male uh, anthropologists and archaeologists as, as we have come to appreciate they are uh, so important in more recent times. So the study of these types of objects has really um, only taken off in the last several decades. Uh, and, and part of that was through the work of, of people like Jim Advasio. Uh, and one of my other former mentors, uh, Catherine Fowler, who, who was an ethnobiologist who worked with a lot of groups uh, in the Great Basin. Um, nowadays, uh, I, I, up until last summer, I, I taught at Mercer's University, in fact, the place where I got my college uh, education. Um, but as of last August, uh, I accepted a position, my wife and I both did, um, here at the University of Arizona. And so right now I'm split between the School of Anthropology, the Anthropology Program at the University of Arizona and the Arizona State Museum. And it's really is the best of both worlds. I'm teaching two courses a year. I get to have great graduate students like, like Jennifer, who I get to work with. Um, and I have access to the collections and, and materials that are available uh, in the museum. Uh, and so it's a little bit of feeling like a kid in a candy store in terms of the things that I can look at and, and visit and, and sort of uh, examine, um, but also things that are available to me as a resource and, and that I can help um, you know, try and share with other people to make sure that other people are aware these things exist. But on top of that, I, I still get sent uh, artifacts and materials by other archeologists and researchers who don't have anywhere else to send them. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that there, there really are just very few of us that study these types of objects. So you're looking here at a basket um, that, that was radiocarbon dated about 1800 years ago. Uh, it was excavated by Craig Lee and his colleagues and, and Craig's actually based out of um, uh, the um, University of Colorado Boulder. Um, but he has been doing field work uh, at some of the melting ice patches uh, in the greater Yellowstone uh, basin, greater Yellowstone environment rather. And um, they've been turning up a lot of hunting related paraphernalia, uh, bits of, of birch bark, uh, worked wood and fiber, a lot of stone tools and things that are telling us about human use of these higher elevation per perennially you know, cold or frozen landscapes. Um, going back, in one case, there was a, a fragment of a piece of a hunting weapon, a, an at battle dart, that's been dated over 10,000 years ago. Um, but the vast majority of that stuff, again, tends to be um, hunting related because people were up here uh, hunting elk, um, deer, and, and mountain sheep. And uh, so it's not surprising that that would be the majority of what they find. But again, we, we get surprises. And, and a few years ago, about 10 years ago now, um, Craig and his, his crew encountered the, the basket you see at the lower right. Um, it looks a little bit worse for the wear, uh, but you, you can imagine, um, you know, 1800 years old, it's amazing that we have it at all. Um, they found it sort of eroding out of the edge of one of these ice patches. Uh, they packaged it up, uh, mud and dirt and um, uh, caribou dung, uh, everything all frozen together. On, on dry ice and they shipped it to me at, at my former lab location. Uh, and with um, some very supportive students, uh, we slowly sort of micro excavated it in the lab and uh, did what we could to, to study it and, and learn what we could. And, and ultimately what we found is that it, it really is a large sort of bowl uh, or tray. Um, again, a, a probably a testament to the, the type of women's work and women's activities that, that were taking place at these higher elevations. Um, and I think, one of the things that's really been driven home to me and, and what I tell to a lot of other people when I talk about this work is that um, when you see those sophisticated textiles and the matting fragments from, from sites like Gitra or Cave, um, one, you know, with, with Gitra or Cave, you've got bulrush matting. The bulrush weren't growing anywhere near around that cave 
at 2,500 meters above sea level, uh, you know, 11,000 years ago. Um, those either had to come from higher elevation or lower elevation. Um, you see this basket here. Clearly, the, the basket was probably brought up to this locality. Uh, there probably aren't large numbers of, of willow uh, that this is made out of that, that people are collecting and processing on site to make this. So uh, we're getting in aspects of mobility. And one of the things that, that a lot of, again, the, the traditionally uh, male anthropologists have, have written about is that these higher altitude environments where it's you know, perpetually cold, uh, if you get really up above about 2,500 meters above sea level, you're dealing with uh, hypoxic conditions. There's a lot less oxygen uh, and that has negative sort of health repercussions for individuals, uh, both in the short term, but also long term in terms of reproductive health. It poses challenges to long-term settlement of high elevation environments. Um, and uh, the, the ridiculous assumption was that, you know, probably that women weren't involved with these early explorations and colonizations of these uh, harsh, uh, inhospitable environments because they, they wouldn't be able to hack it. Um, but really, when you, when you look at some of the things like the perishables, uh, Gitarero Cave, I went back through the report and um, it was clear that even though they didn't save it, they noted in their records uh, the large volumes of plant parts, plant processing debris they observed in the, the rock shelter. Um, and that to me indicated very strongly that, that people were there making these things on site. Um, and that suggests that the, the women and, and the men were there together and probably had children. It was probably a family affair. Uh, so we get these rare glimpses of the past that helps sort of flesh things out. Uh, and I really come to appreciate that because not only does it bear on understanding of, of basic questions about, you know, who was doing what, when, and where, uh, you know, what baskets did they have? What did the baskets look like? How did they make the baskets? What plant foods were they harvesting with the baskets? And sometimes we get those plant seeds caught underneath the stitches of the basket, and we can identify those and get direct evidence for what plants that people were consuming and harvesting or grinding. Um, but in other cases, it, it simply is significant to know that they existed to remind us uh, of what people were doing uh, and probably spent a lot of time doing. Uh, when we have really good preservation at archaeological sites, we, we tend to see that um, you know, at, at sites where we have really exceptional preservation, uh, waterlogged sites or caves or rock shelters, we sometimes see um, that more than 90% of the artifacts, the things that archaeologists recover, are organic, they're, they're perishable materials. Uh, in fact, um, Walt Taylor, uh, an American archeologist who worked in Northern Mexico, excavated a bunch of cave sites where you get really good preservation because the caves are dry and the environment is arid itself. And he found that for every finished stone tool, uh, that is every sort of projectile point or, or knife or what have you, every finished stone tool, he had 20 finished plant fiber-based artifacts. So the perishable technologies outnumbered the stone tools that all of these archaeologists make a big fuss about and have been by a factor of 20 to one. Um, and I think those are the types of observations that really are necessary for driving home how important these types of things were uh, to, to people in the past. And in, in fact, even the recent past. Um, as I, I sort of transition here to talk about some of the things that I've been involved with more recently, um, I, I spoke earlier about how the, the value for a lot of this to me is in making this information relevant and useful. Uh, and learning about um, the past and, and making it of interest to, to contemporary people. And um, several years back, I think 2017, uh, 2018, I participated in a, um, oh, a short seminar learning about sort of protecting archeological sites, sort of what to do if you encounter looting at an archeological site, how to record and document it, uh, collect evidence that can help prosecute the, the, the looters who are damaging archeological uh, and culturally significant sites. And I met, um, an archaeologist there who worked for Hiawatha National Forest, so that, that national forest right on uh, the so the upper peninsula of Michigan. And uh, I asked him, I said, you don't, you don't ever come across any perishables. And it, it, I'd known that sometimes they preserve through association with metal, uh, copper, uh, silver, uh, sometimes even brass, um, when they are in sort of frequently moist sediments. Um, they will start to oxidize, the metal will interact with the, the water, uh, and it can interact with the soil chemistry. And what it does is, um, you know, silver, copper have natural uh, antimicrobial properties. What they do is, in effect, alter the surrounding soil chemistry. And so we do get even really wet, uh, uh, inhospitable, for the sake of preservation environments, we get organic materials, textiles, and baskets that survive simply by association with metal. 
And so he said, yeah, actually, we, we, we do get some of these and showed me uh, the artifact you see here, which is, is fragmentary. Uh, on the right, it looks like a little crumped up uh, tissue that someone's going to throw away. Uh, but you see some of the sort of the blue green uh, salts hanging out inside the, the cracks and crevices. And um, we, we noticed that. Uh, and I also was surprised at just how well preserved this was. And this is a site um, that has a, a site, Gete Odena, uh, which is an ancestral uh, Anishinaabe uh, site in Grand Island, Michigan, so in the Upper Peninsula, uh, not far from, from Canada, and uh, an area where we just don't have a lot of organic material culture. Um, but this site had a large fur trade era occupation. Um, but it had also been bulldozed uh, several decades ago. And so things were sort of all mixed up and disturbed. So they really didn't know when this was from or how old it could be. Uh, so they sent it to me in my lab uh, after the seminar was over. Uh, they let me collect a, a sample for a radiocarbon date that I could send off to the lab. And uh, I then reached out to what were then uh, friends of mine at the Arizona State Museum, but I'm, I'm now happy to call them colleagues, uh, Nancy Odegaard, who is a um, internationally known conservator. And I, I just, you know, being involved with this work, I I'm, was aware that you there are ways in which you can unfurl, sort of unwrap these objects. And, and I sort of looked at this and, and evaluated it and thought, this is in pretty good shape. This might be a good candidate. And so what you see in the lower left is the sort of the, the sealed uh, Ziploc bag chamber that we created uh, with, with my student Kay Matina uh, and I uh, set up to slowly over the course of several weeks, uh, we sealed up the textile fragment in a large uh, Ziploc with an open container of uh, isopropyl alcohol. Uh, and rather than just using water, which might um, be uh, more attractive to microbial growth, the alcohol really inhibits it, but, but doesn't damage the artifact. We were slowly really able to rehydrate that textile, slowly open it up, pin it back, and, and Kay was able to come in and sort of brush off some of those copper salts. Uh, what you see on the left is what it looked like when we were done. It turned out better than we could have imagined. And it allowed us to get really detailed information on what it was that we, we had actually um, observed. And we, we think that it's probably given the, the fineness. Um, it, it looks like it might be nettle fiber. It's probably a, a native fiber as opposed to some commercial fiber. The radiocarbon dates suggest it dates to the, the first decades of the 19th century. So spot on with the fur trade occupation. But we've got what, what is probably sort of local fiber uh, to produce this really finely, finely twined um, garter or, or armband or something to that effect. Um, and it's kind of hard to make out in this picture, but it has a, a woven in decoration. Uh, and this became the focus of, of Kay's uh, senior project um, under me at Mercyhurst, uh, my former institution. Uh, she spent a fair amount of time replicating this and working with the technology. Um, and she's now a graduate student with uh, the archaeologist Sonia Atzelai at UMass Amherst. And um, this was great because it was a, a, a powerful connection for her with her uh, Potawatomi. Uh, she's a, a citizen of the Potawatomi. Uh, she's a citizen of the citizen band Potawatomi. And um, so that was a really great connection for her. And uh, when all was said and done, we, we returned the artifact um, and uh, the replica with it. Uh, so it could be shared with the community. Uh, and there's, there's hope and we remain hopeful that it might stimulate uh, a rejuvenation of some of these textile arts uh, within the Bay Mills Indian community, which is the, the closest descendant community. So um, Kay's work very much, I think, typifies a, a lot of where I've been heading um, in the last few years. And, and I think reflects both uh, my growing interest in making the things that I learned about old baskets relevant to people who are interested in contemporary baskets, but sort of in some ways sort of bridging that gap. And one of the ways that, that we, I think a lot of us um, who are involved with this, one of the things that we really come to find and learn is that it's, it's difficult, if not impossible, to talk about the finished product, the basket, without talking about the importance of the knowledge that goes with the acquisition and, and harvesting and processing of the materials. And a lot of that is, is for, for the practical reason that if, if you're not even a little bit conversant with the ecology of the plants, um, you don't really know how to collect them or when to collect them. When's the, the ideal time to collect them? You can end up spending a lot more time and, and energy doing something than you need to. Um, but these are also, this is the body of knowledge that has not survived well. Uh, in, in written literature or, or in oral tradition um, outside of 
of practitioners, people like Gloria, who, who are doing this stuff and keeping this alive, um, there aren't many reservoirs for this type of knowledge. And it's a huge body of knowledge that I uh, only increasingly continue to think about how much um, we don't know. Uh, and a lot of that comes down to just sort of the, the ecology and growth habits of the plants themselves. Sumac that you see here, uh, there's multiple species of sumac. It is not, but very, very distantly related to, to poison sumac. So there's no concern about anybody um, having an, an allergic reaction. Um, but, but several rides to sumac produce these really um, flexible branches. Um, but in its sort of wild, un, untended state, like you see here, uh, sumac uh, or skunk bush, as it's called, um, has a really wild, kind of crazy branching architecture. And basket weavers or fiber artists in general usually appreciate to have elements uh, for, for their work that are really strong and straight. Um, if you've got blemishes on them, like fungus or insect damage or branches that you pull off, those become weak spots, weaknesses in, in the length of the fiber that um, when you're sewing them or weaving with them can, can uh, you know, negatively impact your, your work or they, they look unsightly uh, and, and we don't want that. But often what people have observed, and, and I think this is probably true for, you know, at least 10,000 years, no doubt if, if people have been doing it that long, then they've known about it for even longer, um, is that you can, you can kind of manage and tend these plants. And um, part of sort of some of the transformations, I think, within anthropology and the anthropological knowledge and, and allied fields in the last 40 or 50 years have been a, a great appreciation for the, the botanical knowledge of many traditional communities. And that extends not just to farming communities, farming societies, agriculturalists, but the recognition that, that hunter-gatherer, that foraging society, some of the smallest, uh, socially speaking, smallest scale human societies engage in a wide range of behaviors that involve the, the management and manipulation of the landscape around them. Um, some anthropologists have referred to it as, as light hand management because it's things that uh, all of us that, that engage in some gardening uh, do, you know, a little bit of weeding, uh, perhaps providing a little bit of extra water, uh, pruning, coppicing, that sort of tending uh, has a, a cumulative, a, a net effect that can be positive for the plants. And as it turns out, you know, a number of these plants, in particular plants like willow, uh, even cottonwood, as well as sumac, um, the young shoots, those that are usually about a year old, maybe two years old, um, tend to be the most desirable for certain things like basketry and, and other fiber arts because um, they tend to be the most flexible. Uh, the diameters tend to be smaller, a little bit easier to use but they're also a little bit easier to sort of manipulate uh, as they're growing. And so um, what you see in this image are, are a couple of differences between the unmanaged, uh, untended, wild growing sumac, and then the, the, the modified, uh, you know, coppiced and pruned and looked after plant. And one of the things that's always resonated with me is, is not just that people um, have had this reservoir and, and, and deep body of knowledge that doesn't so often get talked about, um, but that this isn't something that's a, a slow process. It, it's something that's long and drawn out. And, um, you know, it can take years of tending and, and management of a stand of willow or sumac to produce um, these sort of idealized bits of sumac and willow. And in some cases, it willow, willow, you know, you can do it in a couple of years, um, given the way that willow grows. Uh, sumac, I, I know from talking to one of my friends, Chris Lewis at, at Zuni, who's a weaver, um, he spent, you know, three or four years tending a, a patch of sumac on the Zuni reservation, only to come back the first time he was ready to collect it about three or four years later and come to find that uh, Zuni Department of Transportation had put in a new road that obliterated the sumac he had been tending for several years. He was um, more than a little bit aggravated, I will say, uh, with, with Zuni Department of Transportation. But um, it just goes to show you that was just several, several years of him coming back a couple times a year pruning, coppicing, and, and, and stimulating new growth that's gonna provide the most desirable plants. Um, this type of, of, of interest loomed large for me because um, my, one of my first graduate advisors, Catherine Fowler, uh, the, the ethnobiologist, um, was very much interested in traditional ecological knowledge. She herself is a, a scholar of basketry and textiles uh, and worked with a, a, a number of uh, Paiute and Shoshone uh, and Washoe weavers um, throughout her career. And uh, it was that point that really instilled to me how much more we can get from the archaeology if we 
uh, adopt this perspective of thinking about the the contemporary pieces, the contemporary bodies of knowledge, the contemporary museum collections as the endpoint or destination of everything that came before. And that we need to pay attention to the, the more recent baskets because they are the culmination of all the decisions and choices that, that weavers made in years past and how that knowledge was transmitted from one generation to the next. And we also see too how a lot of that knowledge has not survived or, or it's, it's been broken or lost. Uh, and there are ways that we can think about reclaiming it. And so increasingly, not just because um, I, I, because of Kay's influence, uh, you know, acknowledge the importance of, of being really conversant with the museum collections and what's out there and what people are still doing and, and learning how to do it myself. Um, it became more a question of thinking about how I can get and, ex and extract is not the right word because that, that has a negative connotation, but what can I do to um, reclaim or, or um, uh, copy and paste some of that traditional knowledge that's recorded in archeological materials and share it with people living now. Um, and sometimes as I've learned, that can be as simple as, as working to identify the material that something is made out of. Um, plant material identifications, I'm not a botanist. Uh, I've had just enough botany classes to be dangerous, but I'm, I'm not a botanist and, and plant identifications are notoriously difficult for baskets and textiles in large part because they uh, are modified in the process of, of turning them into string or warps and wefts and things like that. And so in some cases, um, it can be really challenging to identify them. But in other cases, if you know what sort of plant parts to look for, uh, you can make a really convincing argument. And so what you see here is an example of a, a slipper. Um, it's, it's not quite a sandal because uh, it doesn't have quite the open architecture that we associate with sandals, but we think of them as a form of slipper. Um, this is woven out of what we were able to identify very easily because some of the surviving um, uh, seed heads uh, and plant parts that were really diagnostic were preserved on the inside of the slipper, uh, made from a plant called rattlesnake master. Uh, and this comes from, of all the sort of un un unexpected places, a, a rock shelter in southeastern Tennessee, um, where we just really don't have many perishables. Uh, and we radiocarbon dated this to about, uh, you know, the AD 400s. Um, so it, it's quite, quite old. Uh, you can even make out some of the sort of the dark fiber, the dyed fiber decoration, giving you a couple of almost like racing stripes on the top of your, your woven slipper. Um, but one of the things that, that uh, sort of struck me as, as we were working through some of this material is, again, you know, we get these glimpses of things that just, you know, in the Southeast don't preserve because of factors of preservation. But uh, in this case, um, you know, when I started looking at some of the other archaeological literature, there was a lot of mention about Rattlesnake Master and that a lot of other researchers who'd worked on footwear or bits of string and bags that have turned up, um, Rattlesnake Master keeps coming up. And, and you, you look in the ethnographic literature and the ethnobotanical literature, um, and there's it shows up, people mention it, um, as, as you might uh, infer from a, a common name like Rattlesnake Master, uh, it was thought to have um, uh, usefulness in treating rattlesnake bites, but um, I don't think I ran across any any real numerous or abundant references to it being used for for certainly not garments or clothing uh, or slippers uh, or, or really even cordage. Um, and if you look at some of what even the botanists had written about rattlesnake master, um, they talk about how it, it doesn't do well uh, suffering from disturbance. Uh, that disturb landscapes, or, or if you disturb the plant as it's growing, it more likely will respond by dying. Uh, and that suggested to me early in my, my reading and, and learning about these things in Tennessee that, well, you know, the site where this, this slipper came from uh, has been clear cut several times in the last hundred years for, for timbering. Um, that certainly qualifies as a, a landscape disturbance. And, um, you know, maybe that's just extirpated, it's, it's killed off a lot of rattlesnake master. Um, but through uh, one of the uh, group meetings that, that Jennifer organized with the, the Choctaw textile group, um, uh, a mutual friend of ours, Liz Horton, who's a, an archaeologist and paleobotanist, and who appreciates the importance of getting out and work with the plants uh, on, on your own, um, was talking about how she, her experience was that, you know, rattlesnake master was actually quite abundant, uh, and that it was a pretty sturdy, hardy plant. Um, it just people um, don't tend to, to recognize it uh, for, for what it is, but there's a lot more out of it out there. Um, and I was struck because that really was exactly the opposite of what the botanist had written about it 
in the 50s or 60s or whenever it was they'd been writing about it. And so I asked Liz, uh, you know, you're telling me something that's very different than what the, the botanist experts have said. Um, she knows her stuff. Uh, is this, am I, am I correct? Can you clarify for me that this is what you're saying? She's like, absolutely, that, that botany paper is wrong. Um, and, and come to find out, the more you read about this uh, and the more you, know, you learn about botany, uh, sometimes some of these papers that are written about a, a plant like this that doesn't have immediately obvious economic uses, no one's really paying attention. And so I, I think I was sort of took for granted that there's a lot of knowledge um, that we just already know that we already have. But when in fact, even for a, a relatively uh, abundant on the landscape, easy to grow plant like rattlesnake master, um, you know, there's one paper that, that is presented as sort of authoritative when in fact it's riddled with errors um, that a little bit of time Liz spent collecting and, and, and growing the plant uh, taught her otherwise. Uh, and I think that to me underscored how much more we can learn by revisiting these, these materials, uh, some of which that sit in these, these museum collections, but also some of the ways in which they might provide solutions for, for modern issues or, or dilemmas. Um, and so up until last summer when um, we, we took the positions here at the University of Arizona, we've been living and teaching uh, in Erie, Pennsylvania uh, at Mercer's University. And I, I spent a lot of time working with the Seneca Nation on uh, um, some ar archeological research and preservation initiatives. Uh, and not surprisingly came to, to know several of the, the basket weavers um, in that area who work largely with um, black ash. Um, and black ash, as some of you may or may not know, has literally been devastated, almost you know, uh, driven completely out of large swaths of, of the Northeast, uh, owing to the invasive emerald ash borer. This is a, a species of insect uh, that shows up as early as about 2002, 2004, um, uh, invasive from, from Asia, um, and it's not killed by the winters here. And what it does is sort of uh, get born through the bark and sort of dig these channels uh, in the bark sort of eating, feeding, uh, laying its eggs. And in, in effect, um, in a short amount of time, what they do is just in sort of their, their natural way of feeding, will girdle uh, and kill uh, all these large mature trees. Um, and sort of forest, uh, uh, bot, uh, foresters and, and botanists, everybody has sort of been watching this uh, creep northward uh, as they continue to devastate more and more forces, forests. And in fact, uh, we're now at the point where uh, Weavers like my friend Penny here, um, you see uh, the, the large sort of full-sized uh, basket or hamper uh, style carrying basket that you see there um, was sort of typical. Um, you know, that's from maybe six or seven years ago. Uh, just in, in the last six or seven years, it's become so difficult for her to get any ash at all to make baskets um, that she's only now making these tiny miniatures. And with that, she's doing it with ash splints that she gets from uh, somebody in Maine and someone else that she knows in Canada where they have access to the ash. Um, so weavers can't even get access to, to some of the traditional materials. And that was a concern for me because um, what that meant was that, you know, Penny's very talented. So it's not as much of a concern for her in terms of, of her making a living and livelihood. Um, she's, you know, retired now. Um, it, it wasn't devastating for her to, to not be able to do this, but I think on a cultural level, it's, it is devastating uh, to not be able to do this. You, you might not be able to rely on it as a source of income, but um, Seneca are rightly known for their incredible Ashland basketry. And so she had to turn to a, a variety of other products and she's an amazing bead worker uh, and things like that. Um, but it, I, I've been concerned and been bothered by sort of what I think is a broader issue throughout Indian country that there are these issues of not just the availability of traditional plants, um, but in some cases it's accessibility. And that's an issue that appears to be really prominent here in, in Arizona um, is you've got a lot of Tohono O'odham, uh, Akimo O'odham weavers uh, who find it difficult to get access to the traditional materials. Um, you might see some yucca or beargrass plants growing in a, in a median strip, uh, and it is perfectly legal, uh, according to Arizona law, to go collect and harvest some of those plants, um, but they routinely are, are stopped and harassed by the police uh, and other people, um, and it, it, it puts them in a difficult position of not having a, a safe 
place to collect plants to produce baskets that are used for community consumption, uh, nonetheless to, to be made and, and sold for sale. And so one of the things that um, you know, I, I've been working on um, really since uh, around the time of the, the onset of the pandemic was thinking about taking some of what I learned about the plants used in archaeological basketry and, and trying to make that information more useful um, to contemporary communities. And I, I've been continuing to have conversations with, with Penny about uh, adapting alternative materials to use in basketry. And, I, and that's why I put up the picture of her sort of recycling of some of the Amazon packaging because um, not all weavers, and there's, it's perfectly fine, of course, not all weavers are, are game or willing or, or interested in trying to experiment with alternative materials. Uh, sometimes there are strong cultural prescriptions against that type of thing. Um, but, you know, Penny is, is, is amazing and she's an innovator. And so um, what I had been doing is, is sort of beginning to, to stockpile and amass collections of suitable weaving materials. Uh, and this includes uh, materials that um, I was aware of uh, being useful for fiber arts, not because they're documented or, or have been used recently in, in the Northeast, but because I know that they're analogous plants or other very closely related species throughout the U.S. have been used for a long time. So certain species like um, cedar root, um, you know, we don't have a, a lot of access to cedar root in the Northeast, but um, you know, I had the opportunity uh, up around the time of the, the pandemic to um, spend some time poking around my, my in-laws 80 acres of woods in northwestern Pennsylvania, and there's a lot of hemlock there. And uh, I said, well, I, you know, there's no reason why hemlock roots shouldn't be really great and flexible for basketry. So I spent a lot of time digging up hemlock roots, splitting them, thinning them, uh, experimenting with different ways that are recorded in the, the, the ethnographic literature for, for processing these. And they're amazing. Um, and so what you see here in the lower right is sort of a collection. I've got a, a stash of juncus or, or soft rush uh, stems that uh, rush is a frequently used plant throughout much of the desert west uh, in California and Southern California in particular, they're widely used for basketry um, that I collected uh, as well as large quantities of, of some of these split cedar root. And then also uh, dogwood. Um, there, there's very limited reference to the use of dogwood, but uh, over, over that first winter of the pandemic, um, I observed these sort of red uh, young shoots. I said, those, you know, those look perfect for basketry. I went and cut a bunch and started splitting them. And then sure enough, these, I'm like, these are gorgeous. These are beautiful. Um, but I kind of had to wait for them to leaf out uh, in the spring to find out what they were. And it turns out they were a species of dogwood called silky dogwood. And I went back and consulted the ethnographic and the ethnobotanical literature. And I found one reference uh, to some uh, uh, Ohlone weavers in California, south of San Francisco, um, who were recorded using that particular plant for basketry. Um, now, does that mean that no one else used it? No, I, <laughs> I know enough weavers now, and, and maybe Gloria can speak to this too. Once you get that eye for plants that are, are useful or suitable for this type of application, um, you might find yourself cutting a little bit of everything to try it out and see how it feels and see how it works. And so I suspect um, that there are great gaps um, in what we know about the plants that people used and how they use them in the past that are, are gaps because it never was recorded or written down. And that knowledge is, is in the archaeological materials, they're waiting to sort of be reclaimed and reused. So in more recent years, um, what I've been doing is continuing to take students out to work in the, the process and collection of these plants. Uh, my, my old office, you see I had large stashes here of, of willow uh, and cattails that I was able to get with students really close to campus. So it was a great opportunity to go out, uh, talk about the ethnobotanical knowledge associated with these plants, talk about the cattails that are used as a fiber source, uh, the pollen and the rhizomes as a food source, uh, and then have them later in the term once they dried out a little bit, teach them a little bit about weaving, uh, have them make cattail mats. Um, uh, teach them how to make string. Uh, that's stuff that really resonates, obviously, not only with, with even adults, but uh, students and, and kids. Um, and it, it's something that uh, I think, you know, speaks to, uh, you know, I don't know, a, a lot of us have sort of inherent um, uh, biophilia, that sort of affinity for nature and, and being out there with nature. And there's something to be said about uh, making that connection. Uh, and students respond to it and they learn very well from it. Uh, and um, it's really something that they take away with them. And once I started doing it habitually, rather than just sort of once in a while, 
Um, I, I can't think of ever going back to not doing it or, or in fact, I try and figure out ways to do more of it because um, every chance we get to do it in class, the students love it. I love it. I'm always learning stuff. The students are learning things. Uh, and particularly here in, in Arizona, where um, the, you know, there's such a great proportion of native students, it's great to get native students who say, oh, I do some weaving or um, you know, their parents are weavers. And this might be a little bit of a spark that, that ignites uh, their interest in going out and collecting some plants and working with their relatives. Um, one other thing, and then I'll, 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 I'll conclude with a couple of uh, Jennifer slides so she can talk about the really cool stuff that she's been doing. Um, more recently, we're also working not just with, with basket weavers, but um, you see here uh, Jennifer and, uh, in, the, in the sort of middle there with uh, another incoming grad student, Amanda Semenko, and my, my colleague, Martin Welker on the left, who's a zooarchaeologist. Uh, and then that's Piero Tiwa Pueblo Weaver, Louis Garcia there. Uh, and, and Martin and I got a small grant uh, sort of pilot study of research um, to revisit some of these sa sashes that date back to this 8700s, 800s uh, from Northern Arizona. Uh, and they're cool, not just because they're, they're really well preserved. That's a, a close up of one of the sashes on the left you see, but um, they're made from dog hair. Uh, and in fact, even more than that, they're, they're dog hair, spun dog hair that's been mixed with cotton. And um, in fact, when the, the dating information came back, uh, it became apparent that, you know, this is not only uh, a mixture of fibers, but it's probably some of the earliest good, well-dated evidence for the use of cotton fiber in this part of the Four Corners region of the Northern Southwest, um, because it, it's only showing up in, in large textiles and, and looms and, and all the sort of complicated paraphernalia that goes along with cotton agriculture and, and textile production after about 1000 AD. Um, so what we've been interested in is sort of what similarities are there that exist between the, the properties of dog hair and cotton fiber. They have short staple lengths. They're kind of slippery fibers. Uh, Louis is a, a master spinner and weaver. And so we brought him out to sort of talk about spinning. He spent some time teaching us to spin or, or Jennifer's a, a quite a spinner herself. So really it was, it was down to Louis uh, and Jennifer teaching us how to spin and, and work with some of these fibers. But um, a recognition that, you know, Louis comes to this with a set of eyes uh, as Jennifer does when they look at the archeological materials and the spindle whorls and the spindle sticks like Louis holding in the bottom photo, they're keyed into particular things, uh, use wear, um, little signatures and features of these artifacts that unless you do these crafts, unless you, you are engaged with these um, habitually, they're lost on you. Um, so not only do we have a, a tremendously fun time, but it was, it was hugely informative. And, and I think it stimulated us to go back and, and think more about some of the, the weaving implements that we've encountered, but also some of the ways in which we might, uh, as we work towards um, thinking about next steps for this project with the sashes, uh, thinking about, you know, uh, spinning and weaving, and, and perhaps there's an interest in some of the, the Pueblo communities uh, to, to talk about and, and revisit the, the importance of dogs. We, we, we can sometimes talk about horse culture and dog cultures for many uh, Native peoples in the Plains and Southwest and beyond, but, um, uh, you know, we sometimes forget that that dog culture entails not just the, the use of dogs as beasts of burden, but um, you know, collecting their fiber. Uh, long hair in dogs is a recessive trait, as my colleague Martin pointed out. And so he said the very fact that you've got evidence that they're using long, long hair for these, these textiles suggests that they may well be keeping a breeding population. Um, so all these other sort of cool, cool questions about how humans interact with not just the plants on the landscape and the environment, but also uh, the other animals uh, are, are what are really looming large for me. And I think, um, you know, resonate with a lot of other people. And so uh, I feel like I've, I've talked probably more than I, I thought I would. Um, but uh, one final point that I would say is that handed off to, to Jennifer for, for the last two slides here. It's just to, to um, talk about um, the fact that, you know, if we think about the, the role of, of women uh, in the past, and it, it's not always so much about status, but sometimes this connection between uh, what it is that, that women of the past were doing in terms of the decisions that they made and how those decisions that they were making impacted a whole host of other choices and decisions that everybody else in the community had to make. Um, whether it be selecting plants when it came to farming 
or coppicing and pruning plants to use for basketry. Uh, these are, are choices grounded in, in a deep ecological knowledge that these weavers and, and you know, craft people of the, of the past had um, that I think we don't think enough about sort of the unintended consequences, the sort of the downstream impact uh, for everything else that people did, uh, that they come down to some of these basic questions that, you know, when it, we're talking about food and, and plant products, um, almost certainly it was women making. So um, with that, I'll, I'll zip it for a little bit uh, and uh, turn it over to uh, these. I should say these are slides that, that Jennifer sent to me when I was preparing for another talk. Um, and these are slides that she prepared for an earlier talk that she gave. So um, she doesn't know which two slides I selected, but I, I think they'll work. Um, yeah. And, and if, uh, thanks, Ed. And, and uh, if there's something you wanted me to touch on that I don't, we can, we can come back to it. But um, this is great uh, to listen to Ed because I haven't heard, I've heard about some of these things like as um, his grandmother's, uh, the gambling basket for many kind of many months now. And so getting to see some of these visuals is, um, is great. So um, like Ed mentioned, uh, <clears throat> we have a group of Choctaw textile artists and we've been meeting in earnest um, every month since 2018 to sort of work on sort of collectively coming together to research and better understand textiles that go back, really looking at kind of pre-European contact textiles, but even, you know, textiles from the 1700s, 1800s, and looking at, um, you know, what we can learn. There's not, um, pe some people are, there's still some, um, wonderful uh, Choctaw basket weavers in Oklahoma, Mississippi, Louisiana, but not so many people doing the kinds of textiles that Ed has been talking about. So twining and um, some, some different kinds of finger weaving still are done, but, but less so using the, the plants um, on the landscape. So here's a picture of some of the, the members in our group on um, Dr. Ian Thompson's land. Some of you might have met Ian. He's um, done just, I mean, incredible work um, as the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer at um, uh, in, in the Choctaw Nation. But he, this is his um, Nanawaya Heritage Farmstead in Antlers, Oklahoma. And so there he's got um, some just a lot of different plants that are important to Choctaw people and history and um, as well as a, a small herd of bison. And so um, in 2019, 2018 to 2019, our group started making textiles for the Choctaw Cultural Center that was opened last year. And so one of the major projects we worked on was this bison dogbane skirt based on a 1700s description of a, a Choctaw skirt that was made with bison hair and a plant fiber. So we collected dogbane both on um, Ian's land here in, in Antlers at, um, where this picture was taken, as well as um, outside of Chicago near where I actually grew up um, and have formed a relationship with an arboretum up there. And they very kindly allowed me to go up and collect plants to bring back to Oklahoma for educational purposes, for teaching classes. Um, and even we got to <laughs> bring some back to Arizona for future, future student use. And Ed's got a whole bunch of his in his office, so now he can kind of continue, continue uh, doing doing that. So, um, uh, or just add to his office stash. But um, we twined this skirt. It was two layers. That's how it was described in the 1700s account. Twined by Sandra Riley here. So she's a really wonderful um, genealogist, researcher, artist, um, and a good friend. She's Choctaw and Chickasaw, and um, she, she twined both panels, but we also had about 10 of us harvesting the, the plants, um, processing the bison hair, 
spinning, uh, spinning the bison hair, processing dog bane, spinning the dog bane, and then twining. So it took a few hundred hours to get through the whole process. And I think one of the, the key takeaways in making this was really just um, how uh, important and uh, significant it was to do with a group of people. So it really helped us um, as far as momentum. It's a lot of time, <laughs> more time than most of us can devote uh, to kind of one project with different people, you know, with kids and, and jobs and things. But this gave us the, the opportunity to sit down and actually really um, take the time to learn about the plants through using kind of working with them um, at all different stages. And, um, and also time together. So two sisters would sit on their um, grandparents' porch um, in, and process dog bane for hours and talk. And, and you know, we would gather every month and talk about kind of what we learned and the progress we had made. And so um, since this project, we've tried to do, do more of that. And so we've kind of just tried to keep learning, obviously with the pandemic, um, that's put a little bit of a different spin on things, but we're still able to, to meet like, like you all are doing, which has been um, really a wonderful opportunity to reach more Choctaw and, um, and also other uh, Native artists across the country. Um, so uh, you can go to the, if you're passing through southeastern Oklahoma um, and you stop into the, in, in Durant, you can see some of the textiles we worked on at the Choctaw Cultural Center. So there's a series of other skirts made with stinging nettle fiber, which we did not process, but hopefully future, in the future down the road, we can do um, some more pieces like this where we kind of collectively work on it. And, um, you know, a lot of different hands incorporated in, in that piece. And, and all of us are, are different artists and different hands, but, um, you know, we really learned a lot through that. So. Um, basically, it's been a lot of fun um, and and we're still doing things and I still um, get to, we still meet monthly online, um, even though we're, I'm no longer in Oklahoma for now and, um, but I'm able to learn a lot from Ed and learn a lot while I'm there and, and bring some of that knowledge from class and from um, the Arizona State Museum collections back into um, our conversations uh, with the Choctaw textile community and um, we're, we're kind of constantly learning. So um, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted me to touch on, Ed, but um, you know, certainly if you, if you all are ever in Durant, um, do stop and I'm, I'm happy to, um, you know, like Ed said, provide any resources for, from what I've learned along the way. So yeah, thanks for, Thanks for letting me join. This is this is fun. <laughs> Thanks, Jennifer. Um, yeah, no, that was that was great. That was great. Um, so I, that I think covers a lot of things that I, I kind of wanted to say or, or throw out there. Um, and I, again, my thinking was um, to the extent that I can, even if I I don't have immediate thoughts or answers, I've got the ability to take down notes and. Um, and can be thinking about resources to, to be able to help, um, you know, address questions or, or, or conduct research or, or things that are of particular interest. Um, so uh, I'll happily, uh, you know, field questions or, or in the event that it's something that definitely, um, you know, Jennifer should answer, then I will gladly um, ask her to speak. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Uh... Jennifer and Ed, that was great. I, I would like to um, open this up to any questions, any comments that any of you have. And Roger, if you have any wrap up that you want to put on this, uh, now's the time, people. Thanks, Ed and Jennifer, so much. That was really a wonderful uh, couple of presentations. Really eye-opening and a lot of information, a lot to absorb. So I'm glad that Lance has recorded this and uh, hopefully uh, people who are interested uh, will have a chance to view the video at some point. Um, so thank you so much for that. I do have some questions, but I want to, for the moment, 
invite others to uh, make comments or ask questions first. I did have one question um, for you, just because for my own curiosity, um, I was curious, you mentioned that there was a lot of um, investment from the anthropologists at the time uh, into these fibers solely, mostly because of who was making it, the women of the society. I was just curious if there was ever a reason documented um, for why they weren't, like if it was just very clearly stated like that, that that's the reason why they weren't interested or if they had some other type of rationale when they decided that. I, I think it's, um, I mean, we, a number of us have, have sort of always read as, as a, a somewhat implicit bias uh, that was operating. Not that um, I don't, I don't know that, that I can think of any instance where someone said, you know, in writing, um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not going to pay any attention to what the women are doing, but I, I have heard anecdotes from, from archaeologists, um, you know, uh, Jesse Jennings, uh, a relatively famous Western archaeologist who excavated a site called Danger Cave. Um, it produced a large quantity of well-preserved baskets, textiles, string that goes back over 10,000 years in Utah. And um, I mean, I, I heard the same story from a couple of folks that, you know, he wasn't too concerned or interested in having uh, someone look at the, the textiles and baskets. Uh, but his wife, who was a hand weaver said, no, these are important. There's so many, you need to have somebody look at these. Um, and I think when you look at some of the, the early and most influential uh, you know, women that were writing and analyzing some of these uh, textiles, the ancient textiles or, or more recent uh, textiles, they were not surprisingly women that had had some background of training, training as hand weavers uh, or in the, the arena of, of home economics, um, where they were more conversant with, with that body of knowledge. Um, I, I think, and this is just my two cents, is that, um, you know, they don't, they don't survive. And so the, sort of the blinders go on when uh, back, you, back in the early days of anthropology, a lot of early anthropologists, they did a little bit of everything. They were part linguists, they were part archaeologists, um, they were part participant observer and when it came to the archaeology they, they they often didn't pay too much attention because um you know they didn't survive didn't preserve so it wasn't really on their radar and was of interest um and that i think is is common now that uh, i still encounter a lot of archaeologists who said well we found this we called you because we don't know what to do with it we didn't expect to find it and i i, I think jennifer and i are both in the habit of telling people now you just need to expect to find this and just be happy if you don't have to call us because these things always turn up. And just by having an awareness of them, people know to look. And, and then a lot more of these things turn up, like a lot more turns up when people just have a basic awareness um, that they might turn up. Uh, their eyes are a little bit keener to, to look for these things and, and lo and behold, that they turn up and find them. Um, but yeah, I think that there's a lot of those unspoken um, biases. and. Uh, you know, there's like a lot of, like anything, there's a steep learning curve initially. Um, and, you know, ceramics and stone tools were, were durable, uh, seem a little more attractive, I guess, rather than, than you know, the female arts. But um, I've, I've always been more impressed by the baskets and textiles that, that people made than, than some of the sharp stone tools. Not that they're not useful. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not dissing on stone tools they're, they're important but I mean baskets and textiles are cooler well thank you so much uh Ed and Jennifer it's really interesting to learn about um my uh great grandmother on my um mom's side uh her name was uh Helen she's a member of the Yakima Nation who's no longer with us but um when she uh you know started down her road on, of sobriety she actually kind of rekindled uh, basket weaving in her tribe. And that's uh, something that she made a part of her legacy and she taught her daughter and uh, she's been in the process of teaching us. So it's just, it's fascinating work. So thank you so much for educating us. Oh, thank you for sharing that. And, and thank you for, thank you for tuning in. I've got a couple of uh, comments. Um, 
And this this might be um, it, the it was sparked a little bit by something you said, Jennifer. Uh, the the project that that you uh, worked on, the collective project, and all the hours that went into it. And this is something that I've I've seen uh, with Deb and the projects that she's gotten involved with it. The the level of skill that's needed and the and the level of work that this stuff is to do. Uh, I mean, Deb is using heavy heavy equipment to do this earth lodge building and, and it raises the question, how in the world did they do this? I, and I just wonder if, if you could comment on the difficulty and the hours and all and um, all that, that that is involved with with doing this and maybe uh, Gloria, you might have something to say about all this too. Well, yeah, I want to. I want to hear from. I would hear from Gloria because I mean she's working on seven baskets, which is a, that's a lot. That's a very um, yeah. That's a daunting task. So I mean, really wonderful. But um, you know, I think also the something to keep in mind is that we are learning, right? And so we were not fully skilled. And 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 I wish, you know, sometimes that we knew things that we learned along the way to begin with. So it probably took us a little longer and, and more people to get the job done at the end because um, we were just, you know, trying to kind of figure things out as we went as well. But but I think, I mean, I will say just as far as textiles and spinning, it just takes a you know, it takes an incredible amount of time. I think that summer, I just remember just spinning all the time, just spinning and, you know, um, hours of that. And I think um, now a lot of people do that alone, but I think that you would probably be doing a lot of socializing, a lot of other things, multitasking while you're doing it. And I think it's easy to think about groups of communities of women spending a lot of time together. Um, so it not being this sort of lonely task, but something that you're doing kind of um, as a part of life, right? Kind of involved with everything else. So so we couldn't, I didn't keep track of the hours because you would just kind of pick it up here and pick it up there and everyone was doing that. And so, um, you know, it, it's it's hard to exactly track it, but it is, it is a really impressive amount. And probably my guess is, people were doing it kind of a little bit all the time. So, but, but if, if Ed or, you know, Gloria, I'm sure you have, um, you have so many projects going on. I'm <laughs> very impressed. So yeah, yeah. Someone else might be able to answer it more. Jennifer, your, uh, your mic is muted. Okay. Did I mute myself? But no, anyway, no, so, um, I, I, okay. I meant uh, Gloria here. You're okay. Uh, we can't, we can't hear you. Lance, you might be able to, if you go to participants and right click on her name, you might be able to, uh, you might be able to unmute Gloria for her if she's having. Yeah, my only option there is ask to unmute and I, I clicked on that. I, I don't have the power to unmute her. Yeah. Well, we wish we could hear you. <laughs> I know you've got something to say. <laughs> Uh, a little bit of technical problem. Uh, Gloria, if if you do find a way to unmute, just chime right in. And okay. Listen. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, now, now we can. Good, good. Okay, so, um, you know, I just want to... Um, share with you uh, how um, people believe 
that Indians sat around together and visited and had had laughed and you know did all this uh, fun stuff while making baskets. That I don't find that true, and I because it's a very uh, well, I guess what I do is I'm my interest was in the designs. And that's why I uh, got into the, it's a long story how I got into the basketry, but my mother was one of the last basket makers. And she tried to get all of us and other relatives to learn how to make baskets. And then she passed away. So I don't know if it's my Catholic guilt or what, but I made it a, a special effort to learn how on my own. And um, so my, my um, focus was on the dimensions and uh, uh, the designs. I tried to find as many designs as I could, uh, you know, through museums and re research and all that stuff. And so my, I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't get the uh, original materials. If you are familiar with my, my reservation, we have a big lake in the middle of it, Lake Tsukagawea. So our, our homelands were along the river, you know, where it was a lot of willow, you know, a lot of abundant, uh, a lot of abundance in trees and so forth. And so, uh, but we're practical people. You know, we're gonna use what we we have available. So, so I got my, my materials from, um, my materials from a, a, a basket making company in Pennsylvania. So that's what I, that's what I use. Um, I am, um, if someone wants to give me the real materials, I'll, I'll make a basket, but you know, um, I don't know where I, I can get it, you know? Um, just like someone said earlier that it's, um, you know, you can't just go on someone's land on their property and, and get it, you know? But uh, so my, my, um, my uh, focus was, you know, just to, to make the baskets and, and uh, replicate, uh, you know, past, past baskets. So, um, and the reason I did this was uh, to fulfill a family uh, tradition. And um, then recently, um, um, you know, they, last year they wanted me to teach a class here. And I was really, I used to teach, I would, I'm a former school teacher, retired. And so I used to teach it in classes, you know, and, um, but I thought, you know, I'm, I'm stingy with it. I work so hard, you know, to master this, you know, and I'm probably the, I should say I am the only person that can really make them really good. And um, so, um, but then, so I really struggled with um, sharing it, but you know, I'm 74 years old, so, I don't want it to die. I, I want my mother's wish to continue. And that's why I'm, I've been teaching it. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's kind of where I come from. And it's, uh, uh, it takes a lot of concentration, you know, a lot of focus, it takes time. And it's, so it's not that, uh, not that romantic idea of us all sitting, sitting around and visiting and, um, you know, getting these baskets made. You know, people are, uh, are um, they have their designs, you know, and it's a family design maybe, you know, but I've copied them. And I know who some of the people are, the ancestors that had made them. So it's kind of from that, you know, that perspective, I guess, that I come from. So, um, we may never get all our materials, our original materials, you know? And um, so that's, that wasn't really my, 
and I appreciate what you study. You know, I really appreciate that you do. I think that's fantastic, and it needs to continue. And um, but I just wanted to let you know where I I come from, and what I have been doing is just a uh, part of my family. You know, it's just to pass it on. You know, and, and teach and pass it on. So that's that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, Jennifer and I, Gloria, have actually been, we've had conversations about, um, very early conversations about sort of maximizing, um, what, what's the appropriate term, uh, leveraging connections that we have to um, make more widely available certain plants. Um, and that was sort of one of my, my you know, interests. Um, I'm probably when I get back east for some field work, I, I'm, I certainly plan on, on cutting some some plants. Um, we might, you know, I don't have a good sense for how much willow uh, you would need. I would assume it'd be a good bit. I, I, <laughs> before we left Pennsylvania last summer, I, I had it in my head that I wanted to. It's a long story, but I wanted to make one of the backrests, the willow backrests. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went out and cut a, a, a massive amount of willow. I'm like this is this is. So much willow. I, wow. I, I, I have. That's what I need willow. right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and I, I had barely enough for half of, of the backrest. My calculations were were wrong. So, um, yeah, that might be that might be fun to to have a, another yeah. conversation about. And sure. uh, because I'm I'm they wanted me to teach a class here with the Rikara people, <coughs> and. Um, you know, where I get my materials, they don't have the willow. I mean, they don't have those because I need to make the frames. We need that for the frame. We've got a yeah. lot of the wrapping, you know, the wrapping um, uh, weaving materials, but uh, not the uh, not for the frame. So yes, I would love to be in contact with you then. We'll, we'll make it happen. Okay, great. We have a hard time with willows ourselves, you know, trying to find in Oklahoma, we could, it, it was uh, really tough. We went all over our region trying to find ones that, that we could use just for the earth lodge. And now we're in Nebraska, we're going to bring a trailer up to uh, uh, the team that you, you met earlier. And I bought two pairs of loppers today for them to cut along the river. But, you know, I mean, that's, that seems kind of silly that we have to go all the way to Nebraska to look for willows. Yeah, I, you know, I think also, and, and Jennifer can probably test this, is that one of the things I've learned too is I've, I've gone out and cut and split more willow. Um, and, and I've learned from my, my friend, Chris Lewis, who's a, a weaver at Zuni, is that not all willow is, I mean, there's, you know, there's dozens of different species of willow and not all willow is created equally when it comes to basket weaving. And I don't know that I had appreciated that because the willow that I was collecting with the student, um, I, I found I was getting really frustrated trying to split it. Um, I'd had such good success with the dogwood. I'm like, why this is willow. It should be, this is a basket weaver's dream. Uh, and it turns out that particular, that, that species of, uh, you know, interior willow, whatever it was that I had collected um, is really probably, I think now only suitable for, if you don't have to split it, if you're using the whole yeah, young the whole shoots. Mm -hmm. um, and that some of the, the sandbar willow or some of the other varieties are, are better suited for splitting. Um, but again, that was something that just, it hadn't been on my radar. I wouldn't have known mm -hmm. uh, had I not been out there working with materials. Um, you know, the in your- leaf, The peach leaf willow is what they used to use. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and, and I, sometimes it's hard to identify. I mean, at least I've found even with my botanic, it's hard to identify them because the differences between the species can be so subtle. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I, I learned and, and is in the back of my mind is what they do in Europe, uh, you know, in the UK and in Ireland. Um, I saw I met a weaver in Ireland uh, in 2019 uh, and she had her own willow coppice. Uh, so like a little a little garden plot, like a, like it looked like an intensive garden plot in her backyard, but it was just solid willow and that she was growing her own. Um, and the, the color and the variation in the color was amazing. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if there isn't a way that we, we can't, 
in a few years time get to the point where we've got uh, a site for a willow coppice or something like that where we can start supplying people with good willow yeah uh, our one of our uh, tribal councilmen uh he wants to grow willow you know for making baskets and so forth yeah in our agricultural um in our state agricultural department they sell the kind of willow that we need for baskets nice yeah yeah that's that that would be great i mean it's it's almost industrial scale farming yeah. these willow coppices in europe yeah, yeah well i we'll, we'll have to we'll have to chat more and and, and swap okay. our resources well, that might be a good uh, thing for the Pawnee Nation to think about with the land that is being reacquired in Nebraska. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, we did find some willow that we could use in Oklahoma. And, and as we were working it, you know, we cut off the tops and put it in buckets of water. And I was real surprised at how quickly they sprouted. And so we went out afterwards and planted about 200 new plants um, at the Pawnee Lake. So, you know, they, they, they can be replanted really easily if we could just find some that we can sprout out, out again. Katie, did you have a comment you were gonna make? Oh, I was gonna, Willow grows wild here in Washington. So <laughs> we've got several Pawnee up here in the Seattle area. You know, we could. I'll come and visit you. <laughs> oh my gosh. I've got a willow tree in the back that I keep hacking down and it keeps growing back up. Oh and, God. you know, as you all know, willow has that hormone, has the, the rooting hormone naturally in it. So, all these old farmsteads that we have up here, everybody has a willow tree because that's how they would help to propagate their plants, was they would just take a piece of willow, put it in water, mm -hmm. and that's how would, they would, you know, produce their own rooting hormone. So, they do propagate very, very quickly. But yeah, us up here in Seattle, if we could help. People elsewhere with Willow, we'd love to. I like it. I like it a lot. I have a, a, another question. And this has to do with the, the body of knowledge that you uh, both have talked about, because there was there's so much knowledge to be known and retained and passed on, uh, how to cultivate the plants in a way that makes them most, most uh, useful and you were talking about uh, breeding dogs so that they were specifically suited for, you know, raw, just a lot of skill and, and knowledge about how to set the in infrastructure uh, that supports the industry, I guess. So I just wonder if you have any, any thoughts about uh, on the historical side, how did that body of knowledge get lost? And, and maybe on the other side of it, uh, what are some of the key elements falling into place to get some of that knowledge back? I, I mean, I, I think it's, um, you know, uh, what happened was, you know, in the immediate aftermath of, of uh, you know, colonization and, and your American arrival is the conflict and, and disease, um, you know, the general consensus is that it was, you know, 80% uh, 80% of the, the population pre-European pre uh, crashed. Um, some would even put it much higher than that. Um, so that's a dramatic loss. And when you think about the, the most vulnerable populations you're dealing with, um, in many cases, young children and, and elders. Um, and when it comes particularly to uh, uh, traditional knowledge that might be sacred or is, is partitioned to different members of the community, uh, and, and deals with not only the, the healing or medicinal applications of plants, but um, their functional uses. Uh, it's those, it's the, the community reservoirs of history and knowledge that, that were the ones that were hit the hardest. Um, and it's, it's particularly sad and, and it's devastating um, how much the same has happened with the COVID pandemic is it's, it's taking uh, a lot of the elders from communities that in many cases were, were the, the last, uh, you know, reservoirs of this type of knowledge, the last, you know, living, walking, talking books uh, to be able to transmit and share this knowledge. So it's, it's a scary thing. Um, and I, I, I mean, I, I think there's no easier single answer, but, you know, the way we get it is, is these conversations. It's um, meeting and sharing. It, it's raising awareness. It's 
It's um, learning about the stuff that, that Jennifer and her group have been doing. It's finding out that Gloria is doing this stuff and, 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 and teaching classes and, you know, pooling our, our collective sort of skill sets and, and networks and resources together to try and do what we can do. Um, I mean, if it's something as, as you know, seemingly straightforward as, as acquiring Willow, then by God, we'll, we'll figure out a way. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm delighted to think that that could be a relatively easy to solve problem is figuring out how to get glorious some Willow, um, yes. you know, in the grand scheme of things. But sometimes, uh, you know, we overthink things or, or, you know, we lose sight. We have a lot, everybody has a lot going on. Um, and so as important as these things are, um, you know, it helps to keep the conversation alive. And so uh, things like this and meeting Gloria and the, and the chocolate textile group are ways to, to keep this going. So um, I, I'm, I'm inclined to think I'd let, let Jennifer talk on this, but you know, there, there's probably a lot more widespread applicability to sort of the model that she and, and her collaborators have developed that, that might be exportable or transferable to other communities um, in this day and age. I'm also growing uh, echinacea, the purple cone. That's and it it grows wild here. You know, I'm way in the middle of nowhere, and um, but that was my grandmother's medicine. And you know, people long ago didn't have the right to just go dig everything up. You know, you had to get permission, and so. Um, you know, that's being lost with the, the way all our, everything is turning into fields, you know, wheat fields. And um, so anyway, I'm growing it. I'm going to see uh, how it, how it comes out. But, you know, I want my grandkids to know that that was our grandmother's medicine, you know, and if anybody wanted it, they had to uh, get the right from her to, to uh, dig it, you know, and own it. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff I, I'm trying to preserve, you know, so just wanted to share that. Thank you, Gloria. That would be um, an interesting thing to kind of investigate further as all of this is becoming more prevalent is, um, you know, that was a huge part of coming of age for our tribe, for the Yakima Nation. Um, when a woman was uh, old enough or a girl was old enough to start, uh, you know, harvesting for fasting. And that was like a huge um, ceremony where the men would have like their first deer or their first salmon. Um, the women would do the basket. Reading, and that would be a huge cultural event for, for a bunch of the young girls. So that would be interesting to learn how different tribes handled that. Well, with, with the Pawnees, we're working with the Rikara again, our sister tribe. And um, uh, we were working on a, a ceremony that, you know, that, well, we were given a ceremony in songs, gosh, probably about 15 years ago. But, um, you know, we're still, we're still working on that, still trying to, our chiefs have said, you know, whatever we do for Pawnees, it has to be the same as what the Rick Rock do. And so we're still trying to coordinate that. And, uh, we haven't pulled Gloria into that circle yet, but we may have to in order to get things done. So uh, we're, we're looking forward to, to uh, providing a better answer in the future. Yeah, you were supposed to come last summer and you didn't, you weren't able to do that. Oops. Do you remember that? You were going to visit my garden. I know it. <laughs> See how I am? Yeah. COVID. Maybe that, yeah, maybe this year you'll be able to come. Whew. Hey, I, I, I'm, in, I'm in Nebraska right now, lady. You can meet me halfway. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't know if if I may 
maybe going myself to the White Shield Power. My my son is going to be in a Sundance in um, Montana on the Crow Reservation. Well, it would be wonderful if you could come down. I mean, we have yeah. a room full of of uh, these uh, mentors and mm -hmm. and right by the river. Yeah, right by the willows, and you could. Well, I'm. I'm. Uh, what you can do? To, and... I'm selling eggs. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk later, Gloria. Yeah, I was selling. So, uh, Roger, I I think you had you said you had some uh, uh, something you wanted to say to start sort of wrap things up a little bit. I don't know if we're at that point or not, but I, I want to say this to you, Roger. If if you could put on your uh, family connections hat and uh, address the uh, Bahail connection that was mentioned earlier, just to highlight that. Um, and uh, I think it was Jessica that had that connection to share with us that sh you know shares her uh, connections to us that way. So I just wonder if you could shed a little light on that for us in addition to what, what else you might have to say. Well, this certainly has been a fascinating uh, evening listening to the questions, the commentary. Uh, and I do have a couple of questions. I sense that we're starting to run a little bit late, so uh, I'm not sure what I'll get to. Uh, but I'll just mention quickly on the bail connections. Uh, the family trees go back to a man named Baptiste Bael, who was born um, maybe about um, 1829. And uh, I recently came across a record from the Missouri Historical Society in St. Louis uh, that they had posted online that had the name of a man who I think was probably his father. That's been a mystery all this time. We knew he was from St. Louis. Uh, Baptiste Bale was his name. So he was either Baptiste Bale's father or a close relative, I'm thinking. Uh, but this uh, family line uh, comes through uh, the Skeedy band of the Pawnees and enters our family uh, in various ways, uh, but mainly through, um, I think his, uh, it was his the granddaughter, Julia, if I'm, I'm not getting that family tree all muddled up. But um, Grandpa George, um, his wife was uh, Lucille, and Lucille's uh, father was an Oto, uh, Richard Janatona. Uh, Richard married um, Jenny Bale, if I'm correct. And Jenny was, I think, a daughter of Julia. Uh, I, I'm sure I'm messing this up somewhere along the line. And uh, so that's how our family is, is connected. And this runs through different people in different branches of our family. So the Bales, the Shanatonas, and the Echoaks are, are, are closely related in various ways. And so let me just ask a quick question about museum collections. Um, Ed, I know you've looked around uh, museum collections nationwide, and Jennifer, I'm presuming you've done so. And Gloria, I wonder if, if you or others here have also done that. But I'm curious about museum collections that have a Ricara and Bonnie uh, materials in, in particular. I, I'm not up on that. So if you have a sense for what is out there in museum collections in terms of uh, gambling baskets and, and similar materials, I would be interested to know if, what you could share about that. Yeah, I, I think it, it varies um, depending on the, on the class of, of material you're looking for. So um, 
I know, and, and probably uh, Glory and her research found a lot that overlap with what I did. So, I mean, it's been a good piece, but in that the article I published on the gambling baskets in Plains Anthropologist, there's a list of all the museums where I was able to write them down. And I, I kind of went through, uh, <coughs> there you go, uh, uh, a bit of a letter writing campaign and reached out to um, a bunch of uh, museums and just inquiring because uh, they didn't have online databases like they do now. And uh, they got back to me uh, sometimes with, with database outputs or prints. Um, but I was focused on the baskets. And so sometimes those gambling baskets or burden baskets wind up in collections that go to museums because the person was a, a basket collector that, that donated them. So I think some of the, the Denver collections that had pieces. Um, but anyway, I, if, if I were to revisit that, I would start with that list that I had generated years ago for that research. Um, but, you know, easily the, the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History and the National Museum of the American Indian and the American Museum of Natural History and the Field Museum. I mean, they're, they're sort of the big national museums um, and they have extensive plains material culture collections. Um, so it, it might be, you know, we, we may well find there's some surprises uh, and maybe there's some, some matting uh, that someone collected that's in one of these collections um, that we just, no one's looked for it. And so we haven't found it yet. Um, about a year ago, uh, one of my grandchildren, um, Lauren White, and he was, he was wondering if I knew how to make those uh, gambling baskets. And he showed me a picture of one. And I just happened to have this basket from a garage sale. And I showed him and he said, no, that, that's not it. That's, that's a not it, but his, his was made different. So he, and I never asked him any further questions about it, but I'm, I will contact him and see what he must have been researching the gambling baskets. So I will find out about that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I've got, I've got lots of resources on gambling baskets and. Uh, oh, okay. And yeah. Yeah. And, and Uchi's basket is it's packed up cause we're, we're moving soon, but um, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, okay. Yeah. We, yeah. We can, we can chat more and, and, and share yeah. resources. Um, yeah. That'd be great. Now, I'm curious. Uh, uh, that would be really interesting to know if there are museum collections that can be looked at. If this would, you know, a uh, uh, person like Gloria or others, as time goes by and people are thinking about reintroducing these technologies and getting inspiration from, you know, older materials. So my other question, another question at least is, uh, thinking about the paper that Gene Weldfish published in 1930 on coiled gambling baskets. Uh, it's been a long time since I've looked at that and I didn't really read it very closely. But did she use uh, baskets that, that were being made at the time? Or was she talking to people who were... Uh, uh, you know, thinking about what they had observed in their childhood or heard from a parent or grandparent. Uh, do you know that? Yeah, she, um, in the article, and I, I haven't looked at it in, in a long time either, but she uh, interviewed, and this is in the course of research that would ultimately be in her, her you know, the Lost Universe book. Um, she was interviewing a couple of women. There were only maybe, I want to say, she says it in the article, there were only like two or three in the in the early 1930s who were still actively weaving or could remember how to weave to make her one um and so Weltfish's research was based on her interviews with with one or two weavers in i think it was 1930 or 31 and and then she also had access to the 17 or 20 odd gambling baskets that were by 1930 you know already part of the high collection that would become part of the National Museum of the American Indians collection. Um, but no, they, I mean, there was no evidence and, and I haven't since run across anything to suggest that anybody else was making them at that point. I mean, it, it might've been that within memory, there were a couple, but um, certainly it, it seemed like by 1930, no one was making them. I, I remember asking my, my great uncle 
um, uh, you know, who at Pine Ridge, who, um, oh, he, I think he was born 1918. Um, and he said he had a vague memory of them, but he said that they, he said they were, they were pretty much gone, you know, by the turn of the, the 20th century. Like that was his impression was that they were, at least at Pine Ridge, were, were pretty well gone. If, if people had them, they were they were old baskets they were still using, like Unchi's basket. Um, but there wasn't anybody actively making them. Now, um, in terms of the technology, the techniques, uh, the materials, I'm guessing that uh, the Pawnee and Arikara basketry was not unique in terms of uh, comparing it to other communities like the Lakota is what kind of observations do you have about you know in a comparative sense on the plains and also older materials like you mentioned in the Great Basin I'm, I'm a little curious about uh, this technology and um, a is it really diverse or and unique to different communities or and b uh, what is the time depth that we could argue you mentioned uh, you know this technology going back in some cases ten thousand years and uh, throwing out dates like that and so uh what is the your assessment of in a comparative sense, are Pawnee baskets identifiable or unique or not? Um, so the, the, the short answer is that the, the basic technology um, that most gambling baskets are made from is um, a single rod. So in coiling, it's, it's technically sewing. You've got a, a horizontal rod and then stitches that are sewn around it. And they're done so in a spiral, that's the coil or circuit. And you build a wallop, almost like if you've ever rolled out a snake of clay and then made a spiral and, and built up a wall for a clay pot. It's the same thing, except instead of, you know, working with clay, you're working with, with fiber that you're then stitching together as you go around to build the wall. Um, you know, most, most gambling baskets are all a single rod and that's both the, the oldest, most ancient, sample or, or, or style of coil basket that we have evidence for going back, you know, 9,000 years in Southern Utah. But it also is one of the most ubiquitous and most common. You see one rod baskets all over the place. You get some that differ a little bit uh, that maybe have two rods that are stacked. Uh, and that appears to be a, a more Great Basin uh, Northern Southwest thing. Um, and those show up on in, in you know gambling baskets from Shoshone groups. Uh, but other than that, um, the big differences tend to be in sort of the form or shape and the raw material. So a lot of Lakota ones, uh, if you kind of were to put them all on a table together, um, the the Lakota ones tend to to resemble a lot of the Cheyenne baskets for you know it could be any number of reasons. Um, Arikara and Pawnee are not surprisingly pretty similar. Uh, but they also tend to be more distinctive in their shape. Uh, Pawnee gambling baskets tend to be almost like um, saucers. Uh, they kind of have a, they're kind of like shallow bowls that then sometimes have an out curved rim. Um, almost kind of like a pasta bowl. I'm trying to think of what an appropriate form would be. But e even within it, there's a lot of variability. Um, and so the, I would say that having looked at all the, the ancient baskets and, and having an interest in the big picture connections and origins for these technologies is that um, we don't have well-preserved artifacts that are organic from the plains um, to, to know directly. But if we look to places like the Bighorn Basin in Wyoming, where we have some fragments that go back 7,000 years, then more than likely that basic technology has been around for at least 7,000 years. Um, in the, the East, it may be likely younger. It might've gone from West to East um, I think some of the oldest coil basketry from the Ozark Bluffs region um, dates back 3,500, 3, 4,000 years. Um, and there's some similarities. So it, it really, it always, to me, it seemed like you've got, the Plains has always been this area where you get a, a confluence of people from East and West and North and South coming together 
and then they all kind of kind of move around and mix around. And in the case of, of the the baskets, I, I see you know in the in the west they look like what you see the further west you go uh, into the Rocky Mountains and, and beyond. In the east, um, you know they they bear some similarity to to the stuff that we see in more recent times. But there's never been a lot of coiling in the east, so it sort of points to the west, but you know, the, the baskets can move independently of the ideas. Um, and so it's, it's kind of a tricky thing to work out. So that's, that's sort of a, a long-winded, I think, answer to your question. But in short, it's almost certainly very old, but um, teasing out the a more detailed origin or deep origin requires data that we just don't have. Um, and that's kind of what I tried to do with the the gambling, the gambling basket research. Okay. I, I just wanted to share something. Uh, like I was saying earlier, the basket that I showed him was the spiraling, spiraling, like you're saying. And that wasn't, he said, no, that's not how they made them. So it looks like each, each rod, you know, as it's going up, like with like the plate is a separate one from the previous one. Oh, so uh, it, it wasn't spiraling. So there, I, I almost mentioned this, but didn't because there, there aren't a lot of cases. So they're actually um, a really peculiar feature of some of the baskets from the Fort Berthold Reservation that I've seen in collections are that rather than being a spiral there, I call them concentric coiling because you have a complete circuit and then another complete circuit, and yeah. then another complete circuit, and that's so you that's, would splice it each one. You splice it. it yeah, rather yeah. It, it's I, I've never I've never seen that anywhere else. Um, that is that's unique to a handful of baskets that I've seen uh, collected in that area. Um, and then there are also the gambling baskets are the big one, but there also are um, there's another there's a couple baskets that I, I know of maybe one or two that are reported as uh, adoption ceremony baskets that are ceremonial baskets, yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and I've got pictures of those. Uh, so yeah, that would be, yeah, we, we, we've got lots more to talk about then. Yeah, okay. Uh, one, place yeah, I, oh, one place I didn't go yet to, and that was uh, Cody, uh, Wyoming, there were some museums there, I guess, and uh, there was supposed to be a, I think a, rip, a Rikura basket or a, you know, a Mandan basket there, and I never did. Maybe one of these days I'll still go. That's they it. Have a, At the ship. Yeah, they have a bunch of stuff there, and I think it's the, the Buffalo Bill Museum in, in Chandra, Nebraska. Um, yeah, yeah, there, they, there's, a, there's a bunch of stuff there. Um, I, they might have, I think they maybe only have one basket though. I'll, I'll, um, I should be able to get your, your email, uh, and, uh, I can send you, um, a bunch of stuff just over email and then. Okay. So, so like, now, uh, you mentioned... Go sorry. ahead, Laura. You want me to give it to you now, or is there some other way? Uh, if, if you can, you know, it might be if you want to type it in the chat, if you know how to do that, I, that way. Um, okay. And then I'll, I'll, I'll send you some stuff uh, in the next couple of days. Thank you. You were saying, Roger? You mentioned the Craig Lee basket from Wyoming up in the mountains uh, dating back about 1800 years ago. And were you able to uh, look at that and, and uh, compare its uh, materials and techniques to baskets in the plains versus baskets uh, in the Great Basin and draw conclusions about that? Yeah, so it's a peculiar thing that the way that, um, without getting too technical, the, the way that, that that basket is made, it's it, it's got one rod, but then it also has a, a bundle of fiber. It looks like um, milkweed fiber on top. And the the supposition has been that the, the rod with the bundle is that you, it, it gets by with a little bit of insurance to make a watertight basket because you get that basket wet, that, that fiber bundle will swell and expand and makes the basket watertight, even if it's not as tightly stitched. Um, but that 
there's no record of that technique of a one rod and a bundle foundation being made in, in post-contact times. So it's widespread and, and goes back almost 9,000 years. But the latest that I've seen samples of from northern New Mexico and Colorado date to the 1200s, 1300s. And then it, it's, you know, it, if anybody's making it after that, I'm, we're not sure where or, or who. Um, so there's, there's no, unfortunately, no real clear direct link between that basket and what came later. But it fits broadly with, with some of the other baskets that have come from uh, that part of Wyoming uh, and, uh, you know, the sort of the, the Northeastern Great Basin, which, you know, in a general sense, there are some, some broad similarities, but, but nothing that screams, you know, planes. Well, I'm asking uh, because my study of old traditions, uh, I've been making an argument for uh, a few decades now that uh, a deeply rooted population that uh, stretches from uh, southern Wyoming down into New Mexico uh, helped give rise to the Pawnees. Uh, and this is a population that, uh, at least in archaeological terms, uh, uh, lived in this region for a very long time and seems to have uh, moved um, eastward into the plains uh, maybe about 800 years ago or so. And my, my argument is that this explains certain Arikara and Pawnee traditions and uh, the other aspects of heritage, as well as Pawnee storytelling um, about the place where the heavens touch the earth, which is uh, located in the mountains of southern Colorado. And uh, so uh, just hearing about this basket, I wondered about, about you know, uh, what, whether this kind of, uh, of uh, technology could shed light on, you know, population connections over time. Just, just a kind of a question I had. Um, I, I mean, it might be challenging just given the, the lack of, of, of data uh, from Pawnee and, and, and Arikara historic territories. Um, but I mean, yeah, it's tricky because you, you have that, that technology that's represented in, in Craig's basket uh, from an ice patch that, you know, I, I've seen in baskets from Utah that go back almost, you know, 8,000 or so years. Um, and it's really common and widespread, you know, a thousand years ago in Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and even parts of Northern Arizona. Um, so we know it's a technology that was spoken across a lot of different ethno-linguistic entities. Um, and so clearly is some sort of deeper substratum uh, in terms of that technology. But I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, there might be, there might be some more stuff to tease out, um, but it would, we need really, I'd, I'd start by going and, and picking out the real best, well-documented Pawnee and Arikara collections, and then, you know, seeing seeing what, if anything specific about those baskets is uh, consistent and, and patterned, and then and then revisiting the, the stuff from, from Utah. The thing that I yes. found different was um, that some of the Arikara baskets, when it came to the posts, they were wrapped together. And the Hidatsa and Mandan, they, they were wrapped separately. Mm. So that was one real distinction. Yeah. The, the, so the, the burden basket thing is easily, I could easily go off on a tangent on that because um, there are some interesting structural similarities between some of the burden baskets here in the Southwest. Um, and there's, there's some debate uh, among basket people here in the Southwest about where the the Apache burden baskets came from because they're different than uh, the Pueblo style burden baskets um, and vice versa. But they're, you know, if you, if you put them side by side, the Pueblo and Apache and, and uh, Mandan uh, Dasa Rikara burden baskets are, are more similar than anybody else's burden baskets. The uh, article that Jennifer mentioned in American Antiquity 
it was really my um, effort to uh, explore what oral traditions may have to say about the time and whether there's something to look at there. And my argument was that looking at oral traditional information in the archaeological record, that a population from the far west entered the Rocky Mountains long ago and then went out into the plains. And this is one of the ancestral routes for the Pawnees and the Aricaras in deep, deep time. I was basically arguing that the Pawnees could make an argument based on our tradition of cultural affiliation to Kennewick men. I don't think anybody understood that, um, but that was what I was really exploring. And so deep time roots that lead to a population along the Rocky Mountains and then along the Front Range and then into the Plains based on oral traditional information and aspects of the archaeological record. That's what I was arguing in that paper. And this is important. Maybe I'll wrap up a little bit here by saying that in Pawnee origin stories, Skeedy origin stories especially, Gambling baskets aren't just about gambling. They were uh, a gift from the, um, the creative life force, uh, which is different than, you know, sort of the uh, personified God that we might uh, think of today. But in traditional thinking, this was a creative life force that manifested in different ways. And the first gifts to the first people um, sort of define things about uh, those people. And the, one of the first things given to the first person on earth in Pawnee tradition, it was a woman that was the first person on earth. And she was given a gambling basket. And this symbolized the world and the universe and so there's a lot of symbolism and there is storytelling that we can look at in Pawnee tradition that illustrates this uh, here and there. And so what we've been talking about tonight in the Pawnee uh, way of thinking, we're talking about ancient history. We're talking about the formation of what it means to be a Pawnee. And we're talking about the primacy of women in that world and the gifts that they were given from the universe to illustrate that, to embody that. And so tonight we've been talking about technology and knowledge that pertains to our entire history and our broad heritage and to the way that women are to be in the world. So thanks to everybody for joining in tonight, and especially to Edward and Jennifer and Gloria and everybody else who are uh, absorbing this and thinking your own thoughts about what it signifies. This has been a great evening. So thanks to everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for having me. And, and uh, thanks, thanks, Jennifer, for making time. And uh, Roger, uh, as always, it's a pleasure. We, we've got, um, we'll have to reconnect again uh, and chat more because I haven't seen Nick. And so I'm dying to know <laughs> what, what you all got up to in your conversation. So we'll, we got to make plans to, to connect again. Thank you, Thank you so, so much. much. This was Thank very you. interesting. Thanks so much for, for letting me tag along. This is great and thanks. Gloria, and also for, for sharing all your experiences. Well, thank you for inviting me. Yes, thank you, Gloria. That was most interesting. Yeah, Gloria, I'll send you an email uh, in, in a couple of days when I get a second here. I'm, I'm about to leave town, but I've got some stuff to send you so we can keep okay. chatting. All right. Yeah, and I enjoy meeting all of you. You have a lot, of, a lot to share, and I really appreciate everyone's work and their interest in uh, Pawnee and the uh, Arikara. It's good to see, it's good to hear. Sometimes you think you're all alone <laughs> you know, in this effort. And um, so, 
Well, thank, thank you all, and good luck to you interns and your work that you're doing. We're, we're glad that you're out there, and we want to support you. All right, I'm going to sign, I'm going to sign this off here. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you.